walk every day with you. Let that yoke of not being broken. Let that be an encouragement to you. Let not one of his limbs be broken. And let not his power be broken. Let the yoke be broken. Pour out the balm to the Holy Spirit. Touch him. Cause healing to manifest. Jehovah is the move of the Holy Spirit. Have your way. Speak, Lord. Through your word, by your spirit. Use my tongue. Fill with every life. Write your word on our hearts. The body of your Jesus. And all that is in the death bed says in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. You may be seated. cannot afford to not experience the grace of God. Grace is when you give something that you don't deserve. Some people have defined it as unmerited favor. By definition, it is God favoring you to say something that you don't deserve or you don't want. We can't afford to fall short of that. And the one thing that can keep you from that or could be an obstacle bitterness in you troubles you. It's, it's actually the, the, the source of your unhappiness. The person that you're married to, the job that you're on, isn't the source of your unhappiness. God said to Moses, no man shall be able to stand, or stand before you all the days of your life. In other words, there won't be any person that can keep you from the promised land that I've provided for you. He said, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. And God is no respecter of persons. And in Moses' life, God moved through the miraculous. He did literally the impossible. Nobody, not Pharaoh, not the armies, not the plagues, not the wilderness, nothing stood before him or against him to keep him from God's destiny for his life. And so it is in your and my life. People on our problem. Someone once said that the true enemy is inner me. That I'm the one that keeps me from my next level. That I'm the one that's preventing me from experiencing the life that God has. I'm the problem in our marriage. 
Well, with that, we understood that a, a part of what we have to get over is history. Things that have happened in the past. And then we're going to see today that another obstacle that we have to get over is this thing called Babel, which talks about communication. And then the fifth, or the last one, is overcoming the obstacle of money. And we'll look at that one on next week. If you've ever heard of the building, I believe it's in Dubai, it's the tallest building in the world. Men conceived an idea that they just want to keep building taller. For what reason? I don't know. You know, so the World Trade Center and then the, 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 the new center that they built in replace, and then, you know, they just keep building higher and higher. What's interesting is in the very beginning of humanity, Men had that idea to do something great. And maybe you're here, and whether you're a young person or whether you're, you know, aged in life. I don't want to call you old, amen. The Bible says that the outward man perishes, but the inward man is new day by day. But no matter, maybe you're here today and you aspire to see great things happen in your life. Just as we, we talked about and sang today about greater things. With that in mind, I want to invite you to look at, as I set a foundation for this message, Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 through 9. It's the story of the Tower of Babel. The Bible says that the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. They said to one another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name unless we should be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They wanted to stay together. They wanted to do life together. They wanted to build something together, something great. And their de their, what they desired was so profound that it got God's attention. In verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, look, the people is one. And they all have one language. And this that they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from, from thence upon the face of all the earth. They didn't want to be scattered all over. And they left off to build the city. They wanted to build the city. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. You were born with something amazing on the inside of you. A seed planted by the almighty God. Your life purpose. It's so profound and so significant. And I believe so many live out their lifetime not really reaching what they were intended to accomplish in life. And that not because of the country that they were born in, that not because of the family that they were born to, not, be not that because of the person that they married or the children that they had, not that because of the company that they worked for or the company that they owned. I believe so many people don't reach the destiny, divine destiny that God has intended for their life because of these obstacles that we've talked about. Obviously, this thing being so amazing your life purpose, I believe that the enemy has done everything he has that he could to prevent you 
from ever becoming what God intended. Just like it was with Moses when this deliverer was born, they began to destroy babies because God was sending an answer. And as it was in the days of Jesus when he was born, they, the, the, Satan moved upon the heart of someone to, to have babies destroyed. Why? Because he was trying to wipe out God's plan for man. And I believe from the day that you were born, the devil has been an enemy against you to keep your life purpose from ever coming to fruition. Am I preaching to anybody today? Is there an obstacle then between you and your destiny? Between you and your next level? Between you and experiencing happiness and peace in your relationships? And the question for today is, could that obstacle be Babel? Could that obstacle be communication? What I submit to you through this message is that Satan intentionally uses Babel or communication to prevent you from your promotion. He intentionally uses, and when I say communication, obviously, communication is a good thing. But poor communication, bad communication, or miscommunication can keep you from that next level. And the enemy knowing the power of communication, and especially what took place in this story, uses it intentionally as a stumbling block. The Bible in different places talks about a stumbling block that was set up and it kept God's people from ever attaining the promise. We don't use that in our text messages today. You know, well, I ran into a stumbling block. We use the word obstacle. But in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 8, the Bible talks about a stumbling block of offense. He says, and a stone of stumbling was set before him and a, a rock of offense. Somebody say offense. Even before them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto they were appointed. I want to talk to you today about that stumbling block of offense or babble which the enemy uses to keep you from your divine destination. Notice this in the book of James chapter 3, the Bible talks about offense. He says, in many things we offend all. When you offend, that means you miss the mark, you mess up, you make a mistake, you don't, you don't do it right. And it says, and there's a lot of areas in our lives where we, where we offend. But in the area of communication, if any man offend not in word, that man for sure is a perfect man and is able to control his whole body. I believe that communication, poor communication, bad communication, or uh, miscommunication is the stumbling block of offense that is often used in life, in love, and in relationships to keep you from experiencing the life that God intended for you. It is a stumbling block of offense. In Genesis chapter 11, let me show you explicitly. I wish I had the time to look at this line by line and verse by verse. But in chapter 1, I want you to notice something. Chapter 11, verse 1, he says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. I underline the word and because it's a conjunction. It's saying two different things. There's separate components here. I mean, if you have it in mind that the, all people on the earth just simply spoke one language and that was it, then he didn't need to add the and of one speech. There's a difference. How many of y'all know you can speak English but I might not be able to understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. We're going to break it down today. Now, I imagine that, let's say that all the earth spoke English, but not only did they speak English, they could understand the English that each other spoke. They could understand each other. We know that from this, it immediately begins to talk about because they were of one language, they decided, hey, y'all, let's do let's do this. Let's build us a city and a tower that goes all the way up to, that, that reach even unto heaven. We don't need God to do this. We're going to do this ourselves. They didn't pray about it. They didn't seek God about it. They didn't. They decided they were going to do this. And this was so profound that it got God's attention. 
And God came down and he said, look, he looked at three things. He said, look, the people are one. It it got God's attention when people were on the same page with each other. When they all had the same idea, when they are all united behind the same vision and when they are all united to the same purpose, they were like, whoa, they are the people are one. And of course, he said that they and look at what they begin to do. And now nothing that they begin that they imagine to do is going to be restrained. That sounds like nothing is impossible to them, doesn't it? Matter of fact, if you were to search scripture to find out all the places in the Bible that the Bible talks about things that are impossible, you'll find that it often and most times talks about God, for with God, nothing is impossible, right? With men, it is impossible, but with God, all things, come on somebody, are possible. The other verse of scripture that talks about impossibility is that it's impossible for God to lie. Yeah, all things are possible to God, but there's one thing that's impossible for God. It's impossible for him to what? To lie. The only other occasion that you see this realm of reaching impossibilities is right here in the book of Genesis chapter 11. He said, because the people are one and because they have set their hearts together and they are because the second thing he saw was because they have one language. Now, this that they begin to do, nothing will be restrained from them that they imagine to do. When a husband and wife, when they meet and start dating, they start imagining a life together. When a child is born and begins to go to school and through the counselors and through the educators and thank God for educators. Amen. That that child begins to imagine their life in the future. What if for each and every one of us, whatever we imagine, whether it be as a church to build buildings and to impact nations or as a as a business owner to to get a group that have the same vision and the same desire to take this product and and make it a world renowned whether it be a child who desires to be something great in life or whether it be a husband and wife that want to build a family together. These are the key ingredients to nothing being impossible to them. They have to be on the same page and speak the same language. Like I said, I wish I could walk you through this. Notice what God said. Whoa, we got to do something about this. Because if they imagine something evil, they'll do evil. If they imagine something good, it'll do good. And we want them to do good. But we can't have them calling their own shots, so to speak, because if they imagine to do evil, then evil will be done. So we've got to put an obstacle. Man, this is so good. We've got to put an obstacle. We've got to keep them from reaching their goal because their goal is apart from us. And we know that that can't be good. Oh, that can't be good. So notice, what did God do to keep them from reaching that goal? In other words, what was the obstacle that God set before them that kept them from reaching that goal? He just simply tweaked one thing. He called, or he confounded their language so they wouldn't understand one another's speech. In other words, one guy woke up and the next morning, you know, he went to bed one night speaking English and he woke up the next night and he was speaking Chinese. And he looked over to his wife and he was like, Kong Ching Kong Wai, Ong Ching Kong Wai. I'm sorry. I mean, no offense. In many things we offend all, but if any man offend not in word, if that offended you, I am so sorry. I'm just trying to illustrate this because this was real to the folks that were there. And she was like, what's wrong with you? And he was like, I don't come with y'all. I ain't come with y'all. <laughs> I mean, if you don't know, that's going to cause a problem in that relationship. I can imagine if they did that all day where they're not, they don't understand. You know what? I don't understand you. I can imagine that they will leave. They, they'll end up divorced. They'll end up going in a different direction. And this was true. And in the end of all, 
this people that started out doing the impossible ended up doing nothing in life. And that's us. We started out intending to do something great in life, but we ended up doing nothing. Why? Because of this issue of Babel. Jesus said something that you've got to know. Um, of course, in Genesis chapter 11, let me give you this before I give you Jesus. So, of course, he went down, he confounded their language so that they didn't understand one another's speech. Jesus said something in Matthew chapter 25, uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25. He said this, Jesus knew their thoughts and he said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. United we stand and divided we fall. That just wasn't a, a catchy statement for the United States. That was the word of truth from the almighty God. And what Jesus was saying that day, even Satan knows that every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. He was saying Satan knows that. Why? Because uh, they, they were saying that Jesus was working and casting out devils because he had the spirit of Beelzebub or the spirit of the devil. And it was like Jesus said that don't make no sense. Even the devil knows that he can't be divided against himself if he's going to be accomplished. And a house divided against itself. And actually, because the devil knows, then he works through a spirit of division to bring down nations, to bring down churches, to bring down a people, to tear down your family. All I've got to do is to get them on different pages. So trust me, God is not the one that's confounding your language. God is not the one that's bringing about the, the confusion in your home. Satan is the author of confusion and every evil work. So what Satan does is what God did. He's only an imitator. He can't create anything. He just used what God did in the Tower of Babel and confounds his language against her language. And now because they can't, can't understand each other, now they can't stand each other. Have you ever been there? I'm married, so I understand. There are times when my wife can be talking to me and I literally have to ask her to repeat herself. Not because I didn't audibly hear. Y'all know I, I hear very well. Actually, I hear very well. That's wrong, Brother Percy. I mean, come on now. You know, you can't not hear as well as I can. But it's not because I can't hear her at the moment. Sometimes I just simply, you know, y'all seen Charlie Brown? Y'all remember the teacher in Charlie Brown? Bom, 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 bom. <laughs> I mean, the mouth is moving and then I hear sounds, but I don't understand nothing that you are saying. Sometimes I literally have to ask, slow down, baby. Okay, say that one more time again. What's happening? She's speaking English, but I don't understand what she's saying. One of the number one things that I hear in counseling is one, my husband doesn't listen to me. Amen. And then number two, <laughs> this person doesn't understand me. And that's a tough spot. When someone as close as that spouse is, that you can't understand them? I don't understand. Amen. So this today is the, because it's, Satan knows this. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I believe this is so profound that Paul, writing his first letter to the church, a group of people, knowing how important unity is in accomplishing the will of God for their lives, he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus... That you speak, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you. There's division. And that you be perfectly joined together. And that you all be in the same mind and in the same judgment. I, I can remember when my wife and I first started dating. And uh, matter of fact, on the first date, I am so passionate about what I'm ministering to you today that I can remember, and I didn't want to play games. I, I wanted to know up front if you are serious. We would, I, I introduced the subject of marriage, her marrying me on the first date. Yes, Lord, hallelujah, amen. Don't waste my time. I'm telling you where I'm going, where I'm headed with this. 
not trying it, not, you know, see what it feel like and what it ride like. No, this is where I'm headed. And I remember one of the, I talked about, I didn't bring the Bible to the first meeting. Amen. We were at the Cheesecake Factory on Memorial, or on Gessner on I-10, right at the Memorial City. I remember sitting in the little booth and when we closed the, the restaurant down that day, and I just poured out my heart about my vision for our lives for the future, literally on the first day. And literally what I told her was if we can agree, there's nothing that will be restrained to us. I think I told her I'll be able to buy her any house she would ever want, any car, take vacations, if we can do life in agreement. That unity. Why? Because I know the scripture. Anything that if a people are one and understand there's nothing. Jesus' prayer for us was that we would be one. So Paul, his exhortation, notice that the elements, there, there are some key elements here. He says, number one, I urge you, I beseech you that you speak the same thing. That she, he's not saying one thing and she's saying another. I mean, if you, if you own a business and you got folks that work with you, you being on one accord on your job can cause great increase to come because of the unity. When you're going in the same direction and one's not going here, hey, how about we do it this way? Hey, how about that? And we're pulling against each other. You're not going to accomplish much. But if we can all fall in line, even if we're going the wrong way, we can get there. Come on, somebody, think about it, think about it. The infamous couple, Bonnie and Clyde, Bonnie and Clyde, come on. They didn't have no problems between each other robbing banks, right? Bank robbing is wrong, but they weren't arguing, well, I don't think we should rob this bank. No, you know, I think we should rob this bank. No, that wasn't Bonnie and Clyde's problem. They were like, I think we should rob this bank. She was like, yeah, let's rob the bank. And became famous as a result of it. And in the positive way, you believing in one accord, not pulling against and pushing against. But if you go together, nothing will be impossible to you. So I want to show you today seven keys to clearing communication. He said here, speak the same thing so that there won't be any divisions. You got a vision this way. I got a vision that way. And this is how it comes up. We're driving down the street. We're on our way to a date. All of a sudden, we stopped by the post office, and that's where you messed up. Okay, because when you, <laughs> we were headed out, oh, baby, let me just pull over real quick and check the mail. You check the mail, and now you found out that she done spent some money on something that y'all talked. Come on, right? Y'all talked about this. Hold on, what is this? What is what? Oh, come on, what is what? What is this? I thought we said we weren't doing that right now. Which, you know what? You get on my... Oh, there we go. Started out good. Matter of fact, turn around, go home. Why? There's a different vision. I see that we do the money this way. I see, that we, I see that we should go in this direction with the company. I see that we should do this in the church. I see that we should do that. What's happening? He, the enemy is sowing seeds of discord amongst the brethren to prevent you from accomplishing the will of God and the impossibilities of your purpose from ever seeing fruition. He goes on beyond. He says, I, I urge you to speak the same thing so that you can be perfectly joined together. That is absolutely the ideal for every marriage. That's absolutely the ideal for every church. That's absolutely the ideal condition for every family or for, and for every business is that whatever you do, you do it perfectly joined together. He says, I beseech you that you all be in the same mind. In order to speak the same, you've got to think the same. And in order to make the same decisions, you've got to have the same thoughts. This is so significant, church, that it's Jesus' number one prayer for you. The Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for you. Right now, he's praying for you. What is he praying? That you accomplish your destiny. And the enemy brings the obstacles, not other people, but you. And one of the key is this communication. His prayer was in John chapter 17, he says, neither I pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. 
I pray for them that they all may be what? One. Come on, say it like you mean it. One. I'm praying that they will all be one. That's what got God's attention from the beginning. He came down and he said, look, the people are one. When you are in one accord on the job or in the home, you will be able to do the amazing. He says, I want them to be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you and I am in you and you are in me. I want them like you know the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. He says, just like me and you, God, are one, I want them to be as one. Did you know that that's what the ideal is? God's ideal for your marriage is not for you to be a husband and a wife in God's eyes. He doesn't see a man and he doesn't see a woman. He sees one when he sees you. That's why he said, how can you divide? How can you divorce? He said, from the beginning it was not so. He made them, made them male and female, and he gave them to be husband and wife. And what God has joined together, there's not two, there's one. How can you divide something and it be whole? I can't think in terms of two. There's one of us. Same name, same aim, same purpose, same focus, same vision. Yeah, we call her Marquita, but her name is Stanley. <laughs> Somebody say, go on, Pastor. Hey, we're going to have some obstacles now. You're messing around up there if you want all that preaching and stuff. <laughs> we're going to have some communication. But he prayed, and he said it again. I pray for them that they may be one in us so that the world may believe that you have sent them. Let me give you these seven things and then we can go. Jesus gave us the first one in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37. He said this, but let your communication, your what? Communication. communication. What does Satan want to use as an obstacle to keep you? He wants to use Babel. He wants to use you not being able to communicate. See, if you've got an idea in business, you might have the talent, the skill, the ability, the product, but if you can't communicate it, doesn't matter. You can have the next big thing. I mean, you can have a, a book that should be on the New York seller's best-selling list, but if you can't communicate it, then it becomes nothing. So where communication is concerned, the first key to clear communication is let your yay be yay and your nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than, th than these is of you. I wonder where if, that, if they got that nay, nay. <laughs> watch me. I mean, wa I mean <laughs> watch this. <laughs> watch this. Somebody say, in communication... Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Is that real? You know, what is he saying? He's saying, number one, say what you mean, and mean what you say. This is the first rule, the first key to clear communication. Anything else than this is from the devil. You know how I know? Let me explain. My dad taught me this for years, and then I got married, and I really understood this. He says this from the pulpit. He says it in private. He says, son, a woman has the ability to look you in the face and say yes or no. Maybe you didn't get it. A woman has a, a, a unique ability to look you in the eye when you ask her a question and she says yes or no. What am I illustrating? A woman has the ability to say one thing but really mean another thing. And that simply can be used by the enemy as an obstacle from you all experiencing the happiness in your home. You know, for example, you know, my, we, we've got two boys. One is two and something, and the other one's eight months. And um, <laughs> and and you know, I, one of, we had like a little marriage meeting. You know, we do that on Wednesdays, and you know, we talk about what we can, what, what we can do to be better. Because, you know, if you're going to have a good marriage, you've got to work at it. Bottom line is you're going to have marriage is spelled W-R-R-K. 
not M-A-R-I-A-G. W-R-K. If you're going to have a great marriage, you're going to have to work at it. So we work at it. We take time where we sit down. We talk about it. And, you know, thank God we get clear communication because one of the things I know that she wants is for me to help her out more with the boys and help her around the house. Now, I mean, and now it's a little bit more, you know. And so if, if I get up and, uh, and she asks me, hey, you going to the gym today? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> but what she meant was, is there any way you can help me out with the boys? Man, I'm, am I preaching good? That's what she meant. But what she said was, are you going to the gym today? I was like, yeah, babe. You didn't mean to bring you something back. <laughs> right? So it's kind of a unique thing because she, I, and I, I mess with her because, again, we've got to be intentional about this. I mess with her because I feel like there's times where she's asking me to read between the lines that I should just somehow supernaturally be able to get what she really means. And I'm anointed, and I can hear from the Holy Ghost. But sometimes that switch be off at home. You have to tell me straight up what you are asking me or what you need, right? Somebody say, say what you mean, say what you mean. and mean what you, say. mean what you say. Wow, I wish I could take some time there, but we don't have time. The second passage of Scripture covers the other six keys to clear communication. You may not remember all of these, but if you remember these two things, one, that God says, Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, then you'll be able to remember that, that key. The rest of these are in Ephesians chapter 4. So if you can just remember Ephesians 4 as it relates to communication and business, in the marriage, whatever, individually, <clears throat> notice what God says. He says about communication, wherefore, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. I'm laughing because um, earlier in, in Ephesians, he talked about speaking the truth in love. How many have ever heard that? That you should speak the truth in love. Uh, Sister Felicia, she's here today. So good to see you, bless you. She posted on uh, Facebook yesterday. She said, um, somebody posted, would you slap your pastor if somebody gave you $5 million? And she responded to the post. I think she tagged me on it. <laughs> she said, I'd slap him in love. <laughs> I, I, I replied to her post. I said, as long as you got $500,000 in your other hand. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you got $500,000 in your other hand, slap away. <laughs> Somebody say, speaking the truth in love. <laughs> now notice this, key number two to clearing communication, you got to stop lying. Stop lying. If you don't want to eat there, don't say it's okay. <laughs> Is my wife here? I just want to make sure. Hey, babe, where do you want to eat? I don't know where you want to eat. Oh, well, I've been, I want to go here. Would that be good? Yeah, that would be good. And she can't stand that place. <laughs> right? How many of y'all know that's going to be an obstacle really, to really enjoying the place? Because she doesn't really, really want to be there. So it's so important to where all relationships are concerned, stop lying. Tell the truth. And obviously, you tell the truth in love. Amen? All right, let's go on to number three. And all of these, again, are in Ephesians 4. It's amazing. It's almost like he's talking to people about relationships in life. What is the next one he says? All right, <clears throat> be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. What's the third key to clearing communication? Number three is don't speak out of anger. Again, what's that obstacle that's keeping you from having the life that God intends? It can simply be you haven't learned. See, anger is a choice. Anger itself is not a sin. Think about this. Even God gets angry. The Bible says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, right? 
So it's not a sin. If somebody does something that hurts you, that upsets you, I mean, if they drop an iron and you are burned because of it, you, you, you can be angry about it, but understand there's an asterisk where anger is concerned. I don't think you should live your life out of anger. I believe Jesus came to, he said, blessed are the, the, the meek, blessed are the, the peacemakers, right? I don't think we should live our lives out of anger, amen? But if you choose to anger, he gives you three rules to keep because at that point you are on thin ice. When you choose to be angry about something, at that moment, you are on thin ice. Why? Because anger can cause you to do something you didn't really want to do, say something you didn't really want to say, and to go to a place that you really didn't want to go. So he says, yeah, you can be angry, but don't sin. How can you sin and being angry? Well, I can tell you this. You can be angry at the wrong person. I use this illustration a lot in, in, in communication. You know, you, you told your kids, stay out of the living room. You hear me? Stay out of the living room. You know, you know how we do. Stay out of the living room. You got me? All right, stay out of the living room. You're in the, li you're in the kitchen, and you hear something crash and break, and you know where it came from. And you pretty much know what it was. You go into the living room. You see one of your two kids standing over this broken vase. You are hot, right? It was not only favorite, but it was expensive. Did not tell you. You know how we get big eyes and everything? Did not tell you to stay out and you pow, pow, pow. Mama, mama, daddy, daddy, whatever. And then finally the dust settled. <laughs> but mama, I didn't break you. What are you talking about? I heard something break and I ran in there. And then you want to, you, you, well, I still, I told you. <laughs> that is so, that is so wrong. Come to find out, it was that other one that was in there playing, broke it. The other child heard it, ran in, was standing over as you heard it, ran in, and you got angry and took your anger out on the wrong person. How often does that happen? in life and in relationships where you're hurt and angry about something and it ain't even them. It's something behind them. Angry outbursts. You get so, up, you get so upset, now you're belittling this person. You're demeaning them. Talking to a grown person like they a child. That's wrong. That's sin. Again, many things we offend all, but where words are concerned. The Bible says in the multitudes of words, there wanteth not sin. You're just going off, clean off, because you're upset. We can talk about the problem, but if you're speaking out of your anger, that's on a whole nother level. Let me give you another one. How, how, am, I, how am I doing? You all getting this? All right, next one. This would be fourth number key, key number four. He says, be angry and sin not. And then he says, let not the sun go down on your problem. That means you got to fix it before the sun goes down. Or we, no, we all got to stay up. Matter of fact, get you some coffee because we're going to work through this. <laughs> right? Then the way, way, don't let the sun go down on your problem. Right? So we got to stay up. We got to talk this out because I don't understand how you could think that this was okay and how you figured that we can get through this. And we got to stay up because the Bible say, the Bible say, don't let the sun go down on your, on your problem. That ain't what the Bible say. The Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That means deal with the anger. Tomorrow we can deal with the problem. Where am I going with that? Number four, don't bring up the past. Don't bring up the past. That, that also goes back to last week. In other words, if you're upset about something that was done in the past, you're totally missing forgive, forget, and act like everything is okay. Come on. You're letting things that have happened in the past keep you from your next. In other words, deal with the anger about it because you can't take that into the next day. You've got to forgive, forget, and move on. Now, if we got to talk about some things, that's different than the anger that's attached to things that have gone in past history. Let me move on. Number five, he says, neither give place to the devil. What is this? This is key number five. Don't let the devil use your words. The devil use your words if you're gonna be angry watch out because Satan wants to slip into that conversation and use your words to whoop that person because of the pain that they caused you to have 
remember counseling a couple. This was in another state with another ministry. And I was counseling this couple in the church. And they had been married. They were like my parents' age. They had been married for like 30 years. And he spoke up one time. You know, you know I can cut you off. I'll say some things. And I won't, I'm going to say this in front of the pastor. But I can say some things that will tear you up. How many of y'all know the people closest to you can hurt you the most? I'll never forget that moment because I felt what he was saying. And you might be here and you may feel like, I know, how to, I know how to hurt her. I know how to hurt her. Don't let the devil do that. The Bible says your words are like arrows. Arrows in that day are like bullets today. They wound. And sometimes when you get, and you can play softly for me, sometimes when you get in such an anger about something, you, you're just like closing your eyes. And, you know. That's what the Bible says. If you got some anger and it comes up, it not only is troubling you, but now everybody gets some of this. You kick the dog. You get some of this too. I told you. How you mad? How you so mad at the dog like that, right? It's a dog, man. You get so angry like that. Where is that? Don't. Come on, say it out loud. Don't let the devil use your words. Man, words will wound somebody. Let me get to the next one. Oh, man, I think it cut off. Oh, I'm not down. I'm sorry. Okay, I can connect. All right, don't let the devil use your words. And then the next one, um, Ephesians 4 and 29. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that may that it may minister what is what would be i mean like how can you corrupt communication i come from detroit so like you drive and you got salt on the road the salt can corrode corrupt the metal on the car now you got rusted how can communication be corrupted Co something in it corrodes it miscommunication bad communication how about this don't use foul language you're making a good point, but you've got foul language. Can that corrupt the communication? Oh, yeah, it can. You know, I do counseling. And how do I say this? There was a time I was doing counseling. I was, I was counseling three, three, three different couples. None of them knew each other. And, uh, you know, I'll be in a different place. And it just so happened that each, in each counseling, one man told me, I cuss, I'll just leave it. He said, I cussed at her. Another woman told me, he cussed me out. Another couple told me, you know, and yeah, I ended up cussing. Now, <laughs> you know, he was telling me because she was following him around. How many of y'all know, don't poke the bear? Y'all gonna let me help you? What am I saying? Don't use foul language. It touched something in me. I don't have cussing me towards my wife. And there's things that she does that make me wanna, wanna ask her about it, amen. <laughs> I'm trying to help y'all. How are you cussing at your kids and your Christian? Oh, the Lord ain't delivered my mouth yet, Pastor. <laughs> you know what let no corrupt communication means? It means do not allow. Don't do that. What you might be saying might be right, but how you're saying it is wrong. I'm just trying to help you. And then number seven, he said, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day. What's number seven? Remember, God listens. Isn't that K KXOJ or whatever? A little KSBJ? Thank you. The bumper sticker that says God listens. 
See, if you keep a consciousness of God in your life, then it'll temper the conversation. I, I, it always amazes me how we can get through a whole conversation in counseling, but if it was just two of us, then it done, it's done blown up and now we, we can't talk. Why? Because we don't remember that God is listening to how we're talking to one. If you want a clear communication, you've got to remember. Come on, somebody. You've got to remember God. Y'all help me now. Listen, stand up on your feet. Seven keys to clear communication. He caps Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 by saying, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be nice to each other. Be tenderhearted, forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has what? Forgiven you. This is how you clear communication. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Would you bow your head? If you're here.